I'm hoping what I'm talking about is time, especially considering what uh, the meeting that we've had earlier on and the discussions that have been taking place about uh, our youth. Um, this lesson was basically uh, because I was struck by a blog that I read recently. It was written by a young man called Sam Eaton, who's a young adult, and he was explaining why he was unhappy with the church, and I'm using the term loosely here. And he quoted figures uh, from a study on church attendance, which was conducted in America by the Barner Group. And what I want to do tonight is look at that study and the conclusions uh, drawn from it, and also some of the 12 points that Sam raised um, in his thesis, and see if there's anything that's applicable to us here in Belleville. Now, the article... Um, uh, uh, sorry, there's an article about the Barna Group survey, and it, it reads as follows. While tens of millions of Americans attend church each weekend, the practice has declined in recent years. According to Barna Group's 2014 tracking data, overall church attendance has dipped from, has dipped from 43% in 2004 to 36% today. But beyond a dip in attendance numbers, the, na the nature of church going is changing. Regular attendees used to be people who went to church three or more weekends each month, or even several times a week. Now people who show up once every four to six weeks consider themselves regular churchgoers. Many pastors and church leaders are accounting for sporadic attendance in their ministry planning. In other words, we're planning for people to arrive less frequently. Furthermore, the percentage of people who have not attended a church function at all in the past six months has surged in the last decade from one-third to nearly two-fifths of all Americans. And the shift is even more drastic among younger, uh, younger Americans. More than half of millennials and Gen Xs say they have not been to church in the last six months. And millennials who are opting out of church cite three factors with equal weight in their decision. 35% cite the church's irre irrelevance, hypocrisy, and the moral failures of its leaders as reasons to check out of church altogether. Something that Anne Marie always says that uh, thinking at this point is that we're not here to serve other people in the congregation. We're not here because of the other people in the congregation. We have because we want to serve Jesus Christ. We have because of God. We, we shouldn't be expecting other people necessarily. We shouldn't be looking up to other people necessarily um, with the expectation that they'll never fail because we are all human. So we're not here. We shouldn't be here um, because we're expecting other people not to fail. Um, sorry. In addition, two out of ten unchurched millennials say they feel God is missing in church, and one out of ten senses that legitimate doubt is prohibited starting at the front door. And I think maybe more so in charismatic churches where if you have any doubt, then you're frowned upon because you should not have any doubt in your mind is the, is the headspace there. According to the study and many others like it, church attendance and depressions of the church are the lowest in, the, in recent history and most drastic among millennials described as 22 to 35 year olds. Uh, other studies would say anyone lower uh, than 30 years would qualify as a millennial. Only two in 10 Americans under 30 believe attending church is important or worthwhile. 59% of millennials raised in a church have dropped out, and 35% of millennials have an anti-church stance, believing the church does more harm than good. And millennials are the least likely age group of anyone to attend a church by far. And those last statements are the most worrying ones, because we're seeing it here as well. Where are our youth and young adults? What happened to all those kids who went through Sunday school? The reality is that the kids who went through Sunday school are more likely to return as adults um, than those who didn't. But even so, the numbers give cause for concern. Now, conclusions that the study made on what uh, questions churches could ask themselves to see if they would appeal to millennials are interesting. First of all, is our church real or relevant? Millennials are looking for authenticity, or so they say. And unfortunately, a lot of churches today are striving to win, win over young adults by being relevant 
instead of being auth uh, authentic. Relevance means are we relevant to the age uh, that, that we find ourselves in? Are we relevant to the technology? Are we relevant to things that are happening around us? Are we up with the times? Are we current? But that's not necessarily what the youth are looking for according to this, this study. They're saying they want authenticity. Is the church that I go to authentic? Do the people there truly believe in what is being uh, spoken about and preached? To give you an example of, of this, long ago, before the internet existed, I used to work as an audiovisual technician. And part of my job in those days was to line up video projectors. Now, in those days, video projectors weren't like the thing that we see here. Uh, they were big and bulky and had three cathode ray lenses uh, or tubes, and one for each of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Not yellow, because we're talking about uh, additive primary colors, not subtractive ones. Okay. In order to line up the projection image, um, there would be a grid, a bit like this one, yeah. And you'll turn the grid on, and the, the idea is to line up the grid so that each color is placed on top of the other one. And then as you do so, the, the, each of the colors would become white, like the horizontal ones are there. Now, the better the lineup that you manage to achieve, the clearer the picture would be. But if the grid wasn't lined up properly, this is the effect that you'll get. The message would be blurred. Now, the analogy I'd like to draw is that that lining up of the grid um, is, is similar to the way in which we need to line up in our lives uh, the church, our home life, and the secular world, or how we act in those places. You see, if we act differently when we are at home or at work to when we are at church, then it's as if that grid is not lined up properly, and the message that other people read from us becomes blurred. And if our message is blurred, we can do more harm to the church than good. And that's what being authentic is all about. There's an example in Ananias and Sapphira of a couple not being authentic. Acts 5 tells us that Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan fooled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. Why did the church move so swiftly against them? Surely it's because they wanted to make sure that the message was not diluted and defiled by this couple's actions. So why does this sort of thing happen? Is it because some people believe that there should be separation between church and private lives? In other words, they just play church on Sundays and do what they like the rest of the week? Or is it because they don't know what's expected of them? Or that the secular world gets the better of them? Or maybe it's a bit of all the above. The problem is that when we try to promote Christ and other members of the body are acting in a manner that is unbecoming of the body of Christ, or if we're acting that way, our message becomes blurred and mixed. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And we need to, need to remember this, that at all times we are ambassadors of Christ. The second point that they said churches should ask themselves is, is our church clear in our visual messaging? And they say one of the key ways your church can convey authenticity is by ensuring that what a person sees and experiences when he or she walks into your worship service is consistent with the messages heard or communicated in the service. And the biggest thing is to create a welcoming space that isn't confusing. Now, I'm not quite sure how that works, but anyhow. Um, but I, I kind of identify the, uh, the space that's not confusing with the with the space that's not confusing. Um, for instance, if I'm in a shop where items are not clearly priced, I often would rather leave than ask the price. And in the same way, if you enter an unfamiliar environment, and if some people enter an unfamiliar environment, and the signage does not convey to you where you should go, or where the facilities are, or when events take place, it detracts from the experience, and you might not want to return, or you might want to rather just leave and try, instead of trying to figure things out, especially if you're shy and not used to talking to people and, uh, and uh, basically don't want to make, be seen as 
being foolish sometimes. But I think more, more importantly what we can gain from that is that if the lifestyles of the church members is out of sync with what is taught from the pulpit, it means that the message is diluted. Another one that I wasn't too sure about the first time I saw it is, is our church setting a place of action or rest? The upshot of this comment is that many churches are concerned with getting people involved in activities all the time. But people also need time for rest and reflection. And it's good for that to take place as well. And I think, again, maybe this message needs to, it would apply more to charismatic churches than traditional churches because people expect the church to be a sanctuary, to be a place where they can have the opportunity for rest and reflection and praising God. But in a hyped-up music experience type church, that's less likely to happen. But this one does apply to us. Is our church being Jesus? As a church, we are supposed to be different to the world. And visitors should see that in how we act and what we do. And what we do should be showing love for one another. Is our church helping millennials find mentors? That's the last one that they had in this group of five things that churches could ask themselves. They say millennials don't feel the same sense of obligation to attend church that previous generations may have. But at the same time, being part of a faith community can provide young adults with exactly the mentorship and guidance they crave from older adults. Barna research shows that young adults who remain involved in a local church beyond their teen years are twice as likely as those who don't have a close personal relation, friendship, at least with an older adult in their faith community. Uh, that's 59% versus 31% among church dropouts. In other words, if they have a close relationship with an older adult, they're less, far less likely to drop out of, of the church. They're also twice as likely to have had a mentor other than a pastor or youth minister. In other words, it does, it's not something that just the, uh, just the minister uh, should be doing. The expectation shouldn't fall just upon the leaders and the ministers to be performing that role. But more about this later. Because this lesson was inspired by this blog that I came across by Sam Eaton, who's a, who's a young teacher, and he posted this on his blog. Twelve reasons that millennials are over church. And when we're talking about over, yeah, it doesn't mean over as in above, but over as in I'm totally over this and I'm finished with it. Okay. He starts by saying, I want to send global sky writing airplanes telling the life change that happens beneath the steeple. I want to install a microphone, or a speaker it should be, on top of my car and cruise the streets, screaming to the masses about the magical utopian community of believers waiting for them just down the street. I desperately want to feel this way about the church, but I don't. Not even a little bit. In fact, much like, like much of my generation, I feel the complete opposite. And he then lists 12 reasons why he feels this way. And I'd like to go through some of them and comment on how I think we are faring here, and then highlight them as well. As that's, that's struck a chord with me. And the first one is nobody's listening to us. He says, millennials value voice and receptivity above all else. When a church forges ahead without even asking for our input, we get the message loud and clear. Nobody cares what we think. Why then should we blindly serve an institution that we cannot change or shape? Oh, the eternal complaint of youth. As one person had posted in their response to this blog, no one listened to me either when I was your age. <laughs> but seriously, nobody wants to be part of an organization that they cannot shape. And the youth have an energy that some of us older people have lost. Um, so if we can harness that energy and direct it, it can make the whole body stronger. I believe that through our ministry systems here in Belleville, that there is a place for young adults and older teens to make their mark. And, but maybe we should also be making more of those systems, though, by inviting them to participate more and mentoring them in that process. Secondly, <laughs> we're sick about hearing about values and mission statements. And I think, fortunately, this is one that we haven't fallen into, but for, from what I gather, 
is this a big in the churches in, in the United States? This is more like what a business does. Okay, this is our mission statement. We're going to do X, Y, Z. But he says, of course, as an organization, it's important to be moving in the same direction, but that should be easier for Christians than anyone because we already have a leader to follow. And Jesus was insanely clear about our purpose on earth. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. In other words, love God, love others, task completed. That's all we need. Why does every church need its own mission statement anyway? Aren't we all one body of Christ serving one God? In other words, let's get back to the word. Let's not worry about what the business world is doing and setting up mission statements and, and working out uh, what our values are uh, in a sort of secular fashion. Let's just get back to the Bible. Third one, he states, is helping the poor isn't a priority. Yeah, he says, my heart is broken for how radically self-centered and utterly American our institution has become. Let's clock the number of hours the average church attender spends in church-type activities. Bible studies, meetings, groups, social functions, book clubs, planning meetings, talking about building community, and discussing a new mission statement. Now let's clock the number of hours spent serving the least of these. Ooh, awkward. Now in response to this, um, somebody, Leslie, at uh, Growing for Life, in her blog said, yep, that's true because it's not supposed to be a priority. But I bet the church that this author is talking about is doing a great job ministering to the sick and needy with its own, within its own congregation, which is exactly what the church is supposed to be doing. Well, that's true, of course. We are supposed to minister, first of all, to the sick and needy within our own congregation. But that doesn't exclude us from helping those around us who need help as well. After all, are we not called to follow the example of Jesus? The danger is that often we might get too focused on the theoretical and neglect helping the starving and broken people that are around us. Now, let's face it, we do great work. Yeah, for instance, at the Santa Claus with the reading and teaching program that we have there. But then you can also ask yourself, how many people in the congregation are actually involved practically in that work? And there are other programs, but not everyone's involved in them. Now, the reality is that we're never going to get everybody involved. But the fact that we are doing these things is at least giving an opportunity for people to serve. The question is, though, do we do enough? And maybe we should promote the work that we are doing more, both to others in the church as well as those outside it. We should be on the lookout continually for areas that people can serve, because this is also an, a way in which we can bring more people into the church. Look at the 67 Minutes campaign, for example. Uh, the United Nations website states, can you spare 67 minutes of your time helping others? Every year on Mandela Day, people around the world are asked by the Nelson Mandela Foundation to do just that. By devoting 67 minutes of their time, one minute for every year of Mr. Mandela's public service, people can make a small gesture of solidarity with humanity and step towards global movement for good. And UN staff around the world have made a difference through a variety of activities in the past, from rebuilding homes destroyed by Hurricane Sandy, to offering school supplies to children, preparing meals for the elderly, helping out in orphan orphanages, cleaning up parts, parks, and delivering computer literacy and work workshops. You see, we could leverage the goodwill that is engendered within this campaign, but look for a local cause that we can promote. And in that way, we could give outsiders a means to participate in something positive and introduce them to the church at the same time. This is an, an example of the sort of thing that we could be looking at in this congregation to get outsiders involved in something that we're doing as an internal thing. That's happening a bit at Vesanta Kral, but it's the sort of thing that we could promote more as well. His next point is, we're tired of you blaming the culture. He says, from Elvis's hips to rap music, from Footloose to twerking, every older generation comes to the same conclusion. The world is going to pot faster than the state of Colorado. I don't know what he's got against the state of Colorado, but anyhow. Okay. We're aware of the downfalls of the culture. And believe it or not, we're actually living in it too. He says, perhaps it's easier to focus on how terrible the world is out there without actually addressing the mess within. 
He says his solution is to put the end times rhetoric to rest and focus on real solutions and real impact in our immediate community. But what he says next is interesting. He says, explicitly teach us how our lives should differ from the culture. In other words, what exactly do you want us to be doing? And his point number nine is very close to this. He, he says there, we want you to talk to us about controversial issues because no one is. He says people in their 20s and 30s are making the biggest decisions of their entire lives, career, education, relationships, marriage, sex, finances, children, purpose, chemicals, body image. We need the means here yeah, to address issues that affect young adults so they have a clear idea of what is acceptable and what is not in God's eyes. And not all these topics are um, the right sort of, a lesson, a sermon isn't necessarily the right sort of platform to be addressing these sort of topics. What are some of the ways that our lives should differ from those in the world? Should we not be teaching biblical viewpoints on the following? And this is not, and this is my own non exhaustive list. These are things I think that we should be t uh, talking about. Swearing, downloading files, copying, piracy, speeding, driving badly, obeying the laws of the land, our attitude to paying taxes, gossiping, drinking, smoking. And it's interesting, smoking is an interesting one because in the 50s, I wasn't there at that time, but I'm told <laughs> that in Church of Christ, you'll go out of a Church of Christ sermon and everybody will be smoking outside because then it was acceptable to do so. But things have changed. Um, we can talk about smoking as our bodies being a temple and smoking is, uh, affects our health and it's bad for you. But then so is not exercising enough and overeating. So these are all things that affect your body. So if you want to talk about the one, you can talk about the other as well. But smoking, of course, nowadays is frowned upon generally. And if we're doing something openly that's frowned about upon by the secular world, then we've also got to examine ourselves and say, should we actually be doing this? Other things, sexual impurity and sexual orientation, overeating, braiding hair, excessive displays of health, of wealth, abortion, drugs, including the, the abuse of prescription medicine. Those are some things that we could be discussing. But those are the sort of things that we should probably be discussing in smaller groups in discussing more openly in, in an environment where we can talk about things that we struggle with personally um, and looking for, at the Bible to try and explore what, how we should be behaving in those instances. The next one he states is, oh, sorry, um, the you can't sit with us effect. Uh, he gave a movie example, yeah, but he says also, my mom said to me, the church has always felt exclusive and, click and clicky, like high school. The sadness in her voice, she continued, and I've never been good at that game, so I stopped playing. And the truth is, he says, I, ex I share her experience, and as do thousands of others. Until the church finds a way to be radically kinder and more compassionate than the, full, than the world at large, we tell outsiders they're better off on their own. But the problem is, yeah, we need to look at ourselves as well. Everybody needs to be kinder and more compassionate. Not, you can't say, oh, I don't want to go to that church because they're not kind there, they're not compassionate, they don't act like they should. You've got to ask yourself as well, am I acting like I should? Am I compassionate enough? Am I kind enough? Am I being nice enough to other people that people would actually want to be friends with me. John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If there's one thing that we can do that will demonstrate to the world that we are different, it's this, by having love for one another. Okay, the next one is interesting. Distrust and misallocation of resources. Over and over, he says, we've been told to tithe and give 10% of our incomes to the church, but where does this money actually go? Millennials, more than any other generation, don't trust institutions. Well, we witnessed over and over how corrupt and self-serving they can be. And there's plenty of information nowadays available on the internet about how 
distrustful institutions can be, from Samsung TV sets being able to record your words, supposedly, that the CIA can use, <laughs> to, uh, to how money is misused um, in churches. He says, we want painstaking transparency. We want to see on the church homepage a document where we can track every dollar. And many churches aren't transparent about where the money goes, and that lends itself to suspicion about what is happening with the money. Some churches spend money on building cathedrals or edifices, and some hide money away. Now, in Belleville, we try to be transparent here. Brad went through our budget uh, a few weeks ago, and we laid out what money was spent where, but we've not got to the point of posting that on our website just yet. Personally, I would like to see more money spent on benevolence. And currently, considering how wealthy this congregation is, I feel that the benevolence figure in our budget is way too low. I know that we rely a lot on direct donations of food for our benevolence, but I'd like to see a figure for that, even if it's an estimate in our budget, because maybe we'd have a fairer reflection of what we're actually doing if, if we did that. But I think there's always space for us to spend more on benevolence. The next point he has is we want to be mentored, not preached at. And I, this was something that was mentioned before in the, in the conclusion to the survey. Preaching just doesn't reach our generation like our parents and grandparents. We have millions of podcasts and YouTube videos of pastors whirled over at our fingertips. And for that reason, the currency of good preaching is at its lowest value in history. Millennials crave relationship, he says, to have someone walking beside them through the muck. We are the generation with the highest ever percentage of fatherless homes. We're looking for mentors who are authentically invested in our lives and future. If we don't have real people who actually care about us, why not just listen to a sermon from the couch, he says, with the added benefit of donuts and, and in your pajamas. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, I think that if you don't make it into the church on a Sunday morning, by your own choice, that is, chances are that you're not going to be searching for sermons to listen to either. But the part about mentorship is valid. Mentorship is, after all, scriptural. In Titus 2, 1, Paul says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. Even though the term mentor is not in the Bible, there are many instances of someone who is wiser and more experienced in the ways of the Lord acting as a mentor to someone younger or newer in the faith. In Exodus 18, for instance, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, act as as acted as a mentor after observing Moses trying to solve all the disputes of the Israelites. He gave him some sage advice there about how he should handle that. Moses mentored Joshua afterwards, and years later, God chose Joshua to be the next leader of the Israelites because he had Moses' spirit and had been mentored for the leadership position. Elijah, Elijah mentored Elisha. When Elijah was taken up into heaven, his mantle fell on Elisha, and he received a double portion of his mentor's spirit. The book of Ruth portrays Naomi as a mentor to Ruth, her Moabite daughter-in-law. Ruth had such a, such, a, such a strong relationship with Naomi that she refused to leave her for any reason. Naomi helped Ruth understand the laws and customs of the Israelites. Mordecai mentored Esther. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, mentored Mary. Barnabas was a mentor to Paul when he was a new Christian. And Priscilla and Aquila mentored Apollos. And then finally, Paul was a mentor to Timothy as well. And he described the young man as being like-minded with him in his commitment to serving God. And their relationship was so strong that Paul called it a father-son relationship. There's no doubt that the older members of this congregation can play a valuable role in mentoring to the younger members. And the last one I want to cover is we want to feel valued, don't we all? Churches tend to rely heavily on their young adults to serve. You're single, what else? 
have you got to do? In fact, he says, we're tapped incessantly to help out. And hopefully we don't engender this response, this response here. But Sam reveals elsewhere that he felt burned out and not appreciated because of the amount of time that he spent in service that he felt unappreciated. And Leslie, in, his, in her reply to what Sam was writing, she said on her blog, all church people of all ages feel undervalued sometimes. Life is very much about perspective. And when we focus on whether or not we are valued, we will always come up short. Part of growing up is doing what needs to be done just because it's the right thing to do and stop worrying about if anyone appreciates us or not. And that's sage advice as well. We can't always expect that we will be thanked for what we do. But we need to do what is right because it's the right thing to do. So what conclusions can we draw from all the information I've shared tonight? What I got out of this rant on social media is the following. If we want to be seen as an authentic church that is in touch with millennials and create a positive public perception of the Church of Christ as a whole, we need to present a united vision of Christ. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And this should be reflected in our behavior, not just playing at being Christians on Sundays, but living with Christ as our example and guide seven days a week. We, have a, we live in a world that has so many different messages about what is right and what is wrong, in a world that people can be convinced by ISIS that blowing yourself up is the right thing to do. We need to stop pussyfooting around and tell it like it is. Tell people what is expected of them in no uncertain terms. If you do something or say something or post something on social media that causes people to turn around and say, and you call yourself a Christian, then we should be objecting to that more openly and explaining to those who do it why it's not acceptable not in order to put them down, but in order to guide them. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. In other words, we need to sharpen each other. We cannot expect people to know what they are doing wrong unless we tell them it is, but more importantly, why it's wrong. We should not be afraid to discuss controversial issues as long as we do it from the standpoint that we are looking for a biblical answer. Remember, we are called to be set apart from the world. Then the older members of the church need to mentor the younger members, which means we should put in place mechanisms to do this, because this doesn't come naturally to everyone. And then we should also not be afraid to publicize the good that we are doing, or public service elements of our walk with Christ, in areas like, for example, for Santa Kral. And we should do that more openly. We need to be continually looking for areas that we can serve and be benevolent and then be clear about where that benevolence is coming from in order to promote the church and in that way hope to bring others to salvation. And then finally, we need to value all our members and let them know that they are valued and loved because Jesus does value and love every one of us. After all, that is why we are. Thank you.